response to that, so I, I, I very much appreciate that. Um, I'd like to first thank the Center for Research and Families for having me, um, Professor Graham for inviting me, and Angela, where's Angela, uh, for just being so wonderful. It's, it's, it's been a long time, thank you. it seems, with our back and forth yes. about the logistics. <laughs> and I'd like to thank you for coming. The sun came out, you could be out there, but you've chosen to be in here, and so I'm grateful. Um, what I'm going to try to do is talk for about 40 minutes, and there are going to be times when I'm going to sort of speed up things, um, but just so that I'd like to have an opportunity to have some questions, um, comments. So, we start here with, I said this morning, I've never met a short title that I like, um, <laughs> ever. Um, and so what I'm going to do is sort of talk to you about how I'm using intersectionality and how I integrate it in, in my work. And I'm going to return to these two photos, but just I want you to remember them. So I'm going to give what's the sort of intersectionality 101, um, sort of the lens through which I see this framework. I'm going to talk about how I've applied this framework to my research in sort of two areas, HIV prevention with black heterosexual men, and then also um, with black, bisexual, and gay men, looking at issues of stress and resilience. And then I'm going to talk about um, something that I'm engaged in quite a bit, which is how to apply a theoretical framework that was not developed in academic circles and for research, some of the challenges with using this framework to conduct research. And then I'm going to talk about some opportunities, because there, I see that there are lots of opportunities for expanding the field um, with intersectionality. So this is just sort of a word cloud, and I'm going to get to sort of start first with the history, because I think the intersectionality is black feminism is sort of critical. I always begin my talks about intersectionality with Sabrina Truth, who I consider to be sort of the original intersectionality theorist. And this is her, if you know this speech that she gave in 1851 um, to the women's um, Convention in Akron, Ohio. This is the famous "Ain't I a Woman" speech, in which she says that man over there says that women need to be held in carriages and lifted over ditches, need to have the best places everywhere. Nobody ever does that for me, or gives me an any best gives me any best place. And ain't I a woman? And the issue there, right, is that her race is mutually constituted with her gender. So clearly, she's a woman. But the issue is that she's a black woman. And so these, are, these parts can't be extricated. And this is sort of central to intersectionality. And then I've been thinking a lot about this photo. This is the Memphis uh, sanitation workers strike. This is the place where Martin Luther King Jr. who had gone to show his support for the strike, he was assassinated here. And so that sort of iconic photograph of black men as they are here carrying signs saying, I am a man. Clearly, they're men. The issue here, as with Sojourner Truth, is that their race is interlocking with their gender, right? And that is the nature of the issue. And so that intersectionality really rejects a sort of single axis thinking about, you know, black here and gender here or sexuality here. And so I, I like to think of this also as an example of intersectionality. So this. So it starts in, intersectionality starts in people's lived experience. It does not come out of the academy. This is not a bunch of, you know, sort of professors sitting around. And this is another sort of example of so the lived experience of Sojourner Truth. We have the sanitation workers in Tennessee. And then we have the Kambaki River Collective. This is a group of black lesbian feminists who are meeting in Boston in the 70s, and they are protesting lots of different things, including a slate of um, murders of black women that are pretty much gone, unnoticed, unheeded, kind of like today. Um, and they advance and articulate sort of this first expression of, of what they're talking about when they're talking about intersectionality. They say, we are a collective of black feminists. We've been meeting since 1974. The most general statement of our politics is that would be that we are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression, and see as our particular task the development of integrated analysis, not you know just women's studies over here or race studies over here, and practice based upon the fact that the major systems of oppression are interlocking, 
and that this synthesis of oppression creates the conditions of our lives. So very important. And I'll talk later about why, I'm sort of why I always talk about the feminist, black feminist roots and my concerns as the intersectionality continues its travels, particularly in academic circles. So in terms of, um, this is an article that I wrote um, for the American Journal of Public Health a few years ago, and it sort of advances this, how I think about it. Um, intersectionality is a critical theoretical or analytical framework. Some people call it a theory. I'm not comfortable with that. It's not a sort of traditional theory in the ways that if you think of the you know, self-efficacy theory or sort of traditional one. So I call it an analytical framework that posits that multiple social categories, I give examples here, intersect at the micro level, people's sort of day-to-day -day experiences, and those intersections reflect interlocking oppression at the macro level. And so when we're talking about intersectionality, we're not just talking about social identity. Some people are, are content to stay there. It's really about the sort of multiple interlocking identities at the individual level, but also what they reflect on a larger structural level. Um, so some core tenets of what intersectionality, and there are many, because one of the exciting things is as it's traveling in the academy, you have, it has sort of sociological roots in some of the work of Patricia Hill Collins. It has feminist legal roots in the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, now in, you know, in public health and psychology. And so it sort of, it's, it's ever evolving, but these are some core tenets. One, it rejects single axis and or thinking in favor of what um, intersectionality theorists call the sort of matrix thinking. And I want to show you sort of one of my pet peeves of the and. And you know this, you have seen this. This one, women and minorities. As is, these are like distinctly, you know, these are grouped from different planets. Um, and of course, this is personal for me, right? Because as a member of, of both of these groups, and so you see this all the time, and we don't even sort of think about it, but that's an example of that sort of single axis thinking. And then you also get the or, I mean, these like pronoun problems. Um, this is an example, this is from the um, Health and Human Services, their action plan to reduce health disparities. And you'll see that it's filled with ors. So characteristics such as race or ethnicity, religion, blah, 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 uh, social economic status, gender, age, mental health, blah, 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 or the notion that these are sort of distinct rather than overlapping social identities. And so, the, the other thing about this um, report is that they make a decision and explicitly say that they are going to focus only on race ethnicity. Now, of course, this is madness because the intersection between race and ethnicity and social status and all these other intersections really help explain health inequities. Um, and so these are sort of my, um, my pronoun problems that drive me crazy when I see them. Um, the other point that I've talked about already is that these social identities and these systems of oppression are interlocking. You can't sort of pull them apart. Um, so that this notion that this hierarchy or what some people um, call the sort of oppression Olympics can't really be played. You know, which are you? you know, which, which is worse? Is it worse to be a woman or is it worse to be transgender? Or was it, It's nonsensical because you can't really rank those identities except when you can. And I'll show you um, some examples of that based on my research with um, black gay and bisexual men. Um, and that another interesting thing about um, intersectionality is its focus is not just between groups, but on differences within groups. And so you can use different types of analyses. You know, you can compare across race and ethnicity if that's your primary location. But you can also do, you know, focused on within groups, which is what I'm interested in. In my work on black men, I'm interested in looking at within group differences of black men. Um, some other core tenets um, examines how power and privilege operate on several <coughs> levels at once. This is really important. Um, intersectionality is, in, is very much interested in, in sort of the ebb and flow of power and privilege. So it's not just from people from disadvantaged uh, backgrounds, but also the privileges associated with different identities. This is important to me because focusing on black men, on the one hand, you could argue that by virtue of their gender, there is some privilege there. But, and, but through, an intersectional, through an intersectional lens, it becomes far more complicated. 
Um, and you can layer that onto that social class and so on and so forth. And so intersectionality is very interested in different power and privilege and how they operate at the individual level, exper experientially, political, and structure, and across and within different categories. What's a, and a point to me that's so important about intersectionality, another core tenet, is the vantage point. Historically, when we in the academy design programs, for, we typically take a top-down view. You know, we sit in our offices and we focus on theory, and it's sort of an ideal view of what, usually what privileged populations will do. Intersectionality really flips that and says, okay, we need to start with the experiences of the groups that we're working on and look at their experiences and build programs in that way. And it's a totally different way from the way we typically design health programs, which are typically for people with resources. Like, so for example, we don't often take into account things like transportation. We assume, oh, everybody can get there. Or, you know, resources to participate in, say, a smoking cessation program. There are a lot of assumptions, most of them class-based, that people who design and develop policies um, go into their work. Um, and this is a very important point. Intersectionality does not aim and is not neutral. This is a social justice framework. That's clear, that's where we start. So we're not even engaging in these discussions about is it objective and all of that, no, 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 no. This is social justice oriented. So now I want to talk about how I've applied it to one of my ongoing studies. This is a chart that if any of you do HIV work, you've seen. These are new cases of HIV um, in the United States um, between 2010 and 2014. This top line represents, this pink line, these are black African Americans. The thing that's just stunning about this is that we're talking about a population that is 13%, black people constitute something like 13% of the population in the U.S. and yet represent some 45, 44 percent of new cases diagnosed. The next line below that is um, white, the yellow line, and below that is Latino, Hispanic Latino, and then the other uh, racial and ethnic groups are far lower. But the point of this slide is just stunningly disproportionate representation of HIV in black communities. And so, my work focuses specifically on black heterosexual men. And the first point I have here, why? Because they exist. And the reason I say that is because I'm often challenged in my articles when I'm disseminating my research, well, how do you know they're all heterosexual? How do you know, you know, the sort of myth that every black man is a black man ha is having sex with, with men or just not telling the truth or, you know, that, that um, expression I've heard, I believe you've heard. Um, down low. And so for me, it just became very important to focus on this population. One of the reasons also is that, as you'll see here, the virus is more efficiently transmitted from men to women through heterosexual contact. And so on the left, the males, this is for black uh, men. Again, this is based on um, data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. You'll see that the pink accounts for, for heterosexual contact. Among men, among um, black men, it's about 15% of men who report that um, um, HIV due to heterosexual contact. Among females, look at the difference. It's 91%. Um, and so you can see that there is a way that we need to focus on black heterosexual men. The other reason is the literature is well founded on relationship power dynamics between men and women in many heterosexual relationships, such that men have greater power, certainly around condom use, than do women. Um, and so it became clear to me, why are we spending all this time focusing almost exclusively to women, particularly black women, telling black women to use condoms, given that those are very different acts, right? For the man, it's putting on the condom. For the woman, it's negotiating condom use. Um, and also, there's a, quite a bit of research documenting instances of violence when women have tried to um, convince or to, to engage in, in discussions about condom use. This is also, there's also evidence of a generalized epidemic in low-income black heterosexual um, communities. What that means is that those are places where 
HIV is greater than 1%. And so this has been well documented, but not talked about. But it's very important because what it means is that HIV is densely concentrated in low-income black heterosexual communities. That means that it has less to do about what you're doing rather than the community that you're doing it in, right? So that, that young girl who's having sex for the first time with this guy she loves, if she's doing it in an environment where HIV is densely concentrated, she is at increased risk of getting HIV. We don't talk about that um, much, but in places like DC, it's just, you'd be stunned at, um, at the rates. Um, in terms of men who report HIV due to heterosexual exposure, so I'm talking about all men now, that number is very low, because remember I told you, it's more efficiently transmitted <coughs> from men to women than with Congress. It's about 9%. But of that group, of that group, black men represent something like 64% of that. And so again, there is a there's, um, dire need, I believe, to focus on this population. Um, in terms of intersectionality and what intersectionality brings to this study, um, the Purdy and Bonds have talked about this concept of intersectional intersectional It's a fantastic article. Um, and how they describe it and define it is that people with multiple subordinate identities, black women, Latino gay men, who do not fit sort of the prototypical, like, you know, the first thing that comes to mind when you think about a group, the prototype, they they experience intersectional invisibility. Um, an example of this is um, Kimberly Crenshaw, who's been um, at the forefront of intersectionality work. She started this pro this campaign called Say Her Name that some of you may, may have seen. And what she's trying to do there is undo the intersectional, intersectional invisibility of police <coughs> violence against black women and black transgender people, because those are sort of rendered invisible. But in the context of HIV prevention, it's black heterosexual men are not prototypical because there's a sort of stereotype that when you're talking about men and you're talking about HIV and you're talking about black men, they must all be uh, gay, bisexual, or MS. <coughs> um, and so there's been for a while now this sort of thought about how, or well, ex it's explicitly said in this Exner article that heterosexual men are forgotten men in HIV prevention research campaigns. This is true. I'll just show you, there are many examples of this, but I'll show you just one. This is the Take the Charge, Take the Test campaign. This is one of the CDC's um, uh, campaigns to increase HIV testing. The campaign is targeted all, exclusively towards black women. And so things like love him, love yourself more. I mean, great advice. <laughs> but, you know, that's what I talked about, sort of vantage point, it does not reflect the reality of the sort of complex dynamic that is negotiating about condoms. This one here, you feel as if you've known him forever, but that doesn't mean you know everything, and your family's hopes and dreams are worth living for. The lives of black women and black men are intricately connected. And so to think in something where you're addressing a dyadic behavior, like two people having sex, and that you would only, you would target the person with the least power um, and also absolve the other party um, of responsibility. This seems um, to be misguided from a public health perspective. Um, I, I said earlier that these sort of single dual access perspectives dominate. So typically, I spend a lot of time in looking at federal statistics and a lot of time being frustrated trying to find intersectional data. Um, and so there's a dominant, this is sort of the dominant paradigm. So they'll give you these are the sort of lifetime risk for HIV um, by group. And so it tells you, you know, MSM, when you inject drugs. But they, it is very rare, and so you'll see the rates. So if say you wanted to know, okay, so what is the lifetime risk of HIV diagnosis by transmission group for black men? You really have to go searching somewhere else um, for that data. Um, and sometimes it's sort of race and gender. So this is African American men, African American women. Well, this is great, but I'm looking for this. If I'm looking at this data by sort of three or four intersections, right? So say I want an intersection of sexual orientation, I want an intersection of, of class. That data is uh, rarely available. 
And it's rare, but sometimes we get data like this. Um, and this is the latest HIV, national HIV incidence. When we're talking about incidents, we're talking about sort of new cases. And these, this slide that I'm going to show you underscores why a focus on black heterosexual men is so important. You'll see here, so these are, the, these are estimates of new infections in 2014. And you'll see here that black heterosexual men are the sort of fifth in, in this lineup of new infections. But this is not the story that's told um, in HIV prevention research and HIV prevention campaigns. But sort of, uh, it underscores how um, Leslie McCall has this wonderful article and she's written about doing intersectionality work, um, methodologically quantitative work. And she says that intersectionality offers a potentially different explanation of the same facts. Um, and this is an example of that, that when you do have that data, you understand things in, in different ways, in more complex ways. So the consequences, um, I'll go through this quickly. It gives um, the consequence of this intersectional invisibility for black heterosexual men is they feel like, oh, I don't have to worry about anything. I'm not at risk. And that's indeed what they tell me in my research. They say, oh, well, I'm not one of those downward roads. I don't worry about it. Um, that it holds women primarily responsible for safer sex. It's your fault. And, and the men, some of the men talk about this. I did a discourse analysis paper where the men talk about women in terms of blame. We didn't use a condom, but she didn't ask for one. That kind of thing. Um, there's a need for men, black men to, uh, black heterosexual men to bear greater responsibility for safer sex. And as I've told you before, research and interventions are rare. So what I want to do now is give you a glimpse of one of my studies in this <coughs> called Menhood and show you how we're applying this framework um, to the data and the design. This in general is our sort of conceptual model. Um, in short, what we're looking at is the intersection of neighborhood level factors, or structural factors, and individual level factors. We are also especially interested in resilience. What are this sort of untold story? What are the strengths and assets that people bring? And what are they that they have at the individual level, as well as what in the neighborhood makes people strong? And so what we did, it's a multi-method, um, a mixed method study. And so all of my studies have a qualitative component. The qualitative component, qualitative research is absolutely invaluable for giving you a contextually grounded understanding of the population, um, particularly when you don't know, particularly when you really want to build research um, from the ground up. Again, that point about I made earlier about a vantage point. And so we brought um, a group of men together from a focus group, and then we used a lot of what they said, their experiences, and almost verbatim what they said about different experiences, to adapt and create um, quantitative measures. And so we just um, finished the quantitative phase this summer with 920 men, and so now we're at the point where we're, anal we're starting to analyze that data, and then we're going to have focus groups and interviews after we have the analysis, we're going to invite them back, and we're going to say, okay, look, we hypothesized this, but found this, this didn't work out. Will you help us make sense of make sense of this data? So what we did, back to the focus groups, we wanted to have a socioeconomically diverse sampling. And so we did two sets of focus groups in each of these different neighborhoods. This blue line, uptown, um, showed one of the things that we didn't expect to find. And this is that, so uptown, this is like, you know, where, where the Washington Monument is, White House, all of that. And what the men started talking about quite a bit was about how much more they're being policed in the, in the areas that are gentrified. And so experiences of they're, out, they're standing out on the corner and here come the police. The neighbors are calling the police on them. And so we're looking at that, and, and so based on that, we did not expect to create measures on gentrification. But it came up in the focus groups, and so it's now something that we're looking at. And we knew we'd get police harassment and violence, and we created a lot of measures. But this is just to give you a, a snapshot of, of the focus groups. Our participants, as you can see, and so these are just 83 men in between the ages of 18 and 48. Um, this is not a highly educated sample. Only two percent of this, only three percent of the sample, two of the eighty-three men report a college degree. Um, this unemployment status, this is a constant in all of my work with black men. 
um, that the sound is predominantly unemployed, and that unemployment, surprise, surprise, is often linked to incarceration. You can't get a job if you have a criminal record. Um, and so you see that here, 66% of the sample report that they have that they have been incarcerated. So here are some of the things that we ask them. You know, what, what makes your neighborhood a healthy place to live or a good place to live? This is premised on, um, on research showing that your, where you live, your block room, can tell you so much about your health. We tend to think about health as an individual variable, but there's quite a bit of research, um, particularly research that's doing some geospatial, that shows that your block room, your, your zip code, tells a lot about your health. And we're trying to use this, this sort of theory to ask about HIV risk. Now, granted, I know that it's not a, it's not a close association. Um, Carl Lapkin, who is a public health researcher at Johns Hopkins University, who does research on neighborhoods and, and HIV risk, he says, you know, what do vacant lots or broken windows have to do with HIV? Um, but we're trying to understand what these sort of mechanisms are. It's not as clear cut as, say, an example I used earlier this morning, obesity research. I said that to you, and you can immediately start thinking, oh, okay, if they don't have lighting, people aren't going to feel safe to be out exercising. They don't have safe, they don't have sidewalks, they don't have grocery stores, they have food desserts. HIV risk is, is much trickier, but we're, we're trying to understand that. Um, we also ask them how important is HIV and what kinds of things in the neighborhood might increase or decrease risk. I mean, we're really honest with them. We're like, look, we know this is not a clear link. You help us understand and think through this, and I'll show you one of the things they say. So in terms of how we're applying this framework, one example is, again, vantage point. How important is it to them? How do they rank or prioritize HIV? And this is an example from a focus group. Um, and so this is several men, and what they talked about is the police, the police, the police. So on, the, on your priority list, how important is HIV in your day-to-day -day, day life? And one of the respondents says, well, it's the police. They're in the forefront of what's going on down here 24, day, 24 hours a day. They ain't gonna be thinking. And this is important. You can't see AIDS, they say. You know, and sort of you're like, your present reality is this notion of feeling that the police are on you all the time. You're not thinking about HIV. That's a, that's a like, distal um, risk. And this, this says, um, this other response, I would say today that the black man, I got 99 problems, and I sure ain't thinking about HIV at the end of the day. This is going to be one of our titles of a new of a <laughs> <laughs> And I told my team, I don't care. We get such a great title. I don't care if we do a paper on breast cancer. I don't care. This is I love this title, which, of course, is, I, I understand, something that has to do with hip hop, and I know less, less about hip hop than anybody in this room. Um, but, and then this, all, this other respondents offer sort of another sort of idea or another spit of this, of the prioritization. We have other things, we have other health issues, we have hypertension and stuff like that. And so HIV is just one more thing added to the list. Um, in terms of, remember I talked about intersectionality, the most important thing to think about with that is this sort of micro level experiential, individual level experience of these interlocking identities but also macro level perspectives. And so this is an example where we said to them, you know, what, what do you think about some of the things in your neighborhood may increase HIV risk? And this lays out sort of some of that intersection. And so one guy says, well, more time, more time on your hands with nothing to do, no job, nothing to do but have sex and get high. So I mean, you know, the unemployment link. Um, we, that's all it is to do, right? Uh, liquor, so the, which, you know, the ease of, liquor establishments in low-income black neighborhoods, well-documented, um, over and over in studies. Um, and then this is nothing to do but watch videos. I think he's talking for a certain kind of video. Yeah, for sure. um, smoking weed, that's all them do. Like you said, boredom. That's what most people do. Smoke and have sex. Get high and have sex. And you have a lot of, they use an old term here, with DV as in venereal diseases. But this notion of you know people at home, nothing to do. Substances are plentiful and, you know, and boredom. And so this sort of is an example of exactly what, you know, intersectionality talks about, about this link between the micro and the macro level. Um, so in terms of quantitative analyses, which we're just starting, 
we are we have a lot of things to ponder. One of the things we need to ponder is like, well, which are the specific social locations that matter? Um, we have some ideas, but we're not exactly sure. Um, what is that intersection between the stressors that people have at the individual level, the macro stresses? One macro stressor, for example, is images and exposure to police violence against black men, which has been in, in, the, um, in the news far too often of late, um, and trying to understand which of those um, has greater explanatory power in terms of risk, um, and just trying to understand you know, at the neighborhood level, what does that look like, and how does that intersect with individual level factors? Um, I believe that intersectionality brings a variety of implications for HIV prevention. One is that it takes the focus just off the individual level and really focuses on sort of what Link and Phelan talk about, the fundamental causes of inequality. Intersectionality provides a sort of window into that, um, that traditional individualistic um, disciplines like mine, psychology, don't often provide. Public health is far better at this than is psychology. Um, that one implication is if you start from the vantage point of, keep, of sort of multiple marginalized uh, populations, chances are, I would wager, you have a better opportunity to sort of center and design programs based on their experiences rather than some idealized notion that everybody should be using condoms, that kind of thing. And so I want to give you just a sort of shot of sort of what the priorities are for the men in our research. Um, they are jobs. Two, that you can't get a job because of record. Uh, police harassment and, vi and violence, gentrification, and they also talk a lot about being a good father and wanting to be a good father um, to their children. By contrast, this is what HIV prevention researchers are interested in. Um, HIV risk awareness, um, making sure that people know uh, their, their risk status, common use, um, pre-exposure prophylaxis, and HIV testing. And so intersectionality provides uh, an opportunity to really sort of flip the script and design research and prevention programs for, from the vantage point of populations. So now I'm going to switch gears a bit and talk a little bit about how I've been applying this to work with um, black, gay, and bisexual men. This is another really long title, because why? I'm not sure it's whether I like. Um, but this is an example of, you know, and I'll show you the quote from, which is, comes the, I call this the blended cake paper. And this is what um, one of the participants talked about that really highlights intersectionality beautifully. So, the thing here is, remember I told you that even if, you know, that intersectionality comes out of sort of black feminist activism and writing, black gay men and black bisexual men have also been writing and talking about intersectionality for a very long time. This is one of the first um, anthologies by, um, edited by Joseph Bean called In the Life of Black Gay Anthology. This is Brother to Brother. This was um, edited by Essex um, Kempfil. And I love this quote, um, and this is Essex Kempfil in the middle, who again is articulating intersectionality from a sort of lived experience. We must be willing to embrace and explore the duality of community that we exist in as black and gay men, that we sort of can't extricate these. Um, and so this study really quickly is a little, a little um, qualitative study, individual interviews done in DC, and we were interested in sort of stress and intersectionality and resilience. Um, and so we did semi-structured interviews, recruited people from um, papers, and it's a small sample, as is always the case, um, or typically the case for qualitative studies. Um, well, women 12, men 12, uh, four gen um, transgender people. Um, a little different here, it's a small sample, 12, um, but you can see compared to the others, um, more men with college degrees or some college or professional degree. Um, and also a higher income range than we found in our sort of larger studies. Sample interview questions. Um, this is sort of the classic cliche question. Tell me about your story. Suppose somebody dropped in from another planet and asked them to tell you about your life, so this is what we ask them. Um, some people say that they rank their identity, some say that they don't. We wanted to go right to this issue of ranking because we, we knew based on you know, just 
um, other works that you've done that there is some ranking that goes on. What are some things that you like most about being a black and gay but bisexual man? And in terms of trying to tap at resilience, well, that was one of the questions, but also tell me about one of your best days. It's so easy. Did I do that? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> um, so we ask people so many times about all the negative stuff in their lives, and so in my work, I really try to balance it. You know, so tell me all this, the sort of sad stories, but tell me what you like about being you. Tell me what are some of the positives. And so again, here's how we've applied it. Again, vantage point. We want to see from their experience, how do they talk about and describe these intersections? Um, and this is the blended cake. Um, this is the quote from which the blended cake uh, paper got its title. Well, it's hard for me to separate my identities. When I'm thinking of me, I'm thinking of all of them, like once you blended the cake, which is such a beautiful analogy. Because you get that sense of when is it, you know, I got the eggs, the sugar, and all that. There is no taking those eggs out of you, and I don't find them as a piece of So you can take the parts back to the main ingredients. So if you got nothing about what intersectionality is, like blended cake. I'm a gay man. Also, there has to be something to say about the aspects of being a black man. But for this participant, they're all they're they're all linked in. And yet, this is not unanimous in, in, in the sample. There are we wanted to know about ranking of identities, and we got this quite a bit too. I would say black first, just because I was more aware of that before I was aware of what being gay was all about. So I embraced that first. And although I can't really distinguish the two, so on the one hand, it is you know, talking about intersectionality. I would say I'm black first. This is also, there's a wonderful quote about um, Essex Hemphill, who said the same thing. He says, you know, I can be a gay man in only certain places in the, in the US, but I'm a black man everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. So even though that same person who's talking about um, you know, not being able to, or that the black and gay part are intersected. Also, it's an and and both. Um, intersectionality complicates everything. Um, what are their challenges? Um, they are what you might expect. This is a quote from a man who is working in a predominantly white um, LGBT um, organization in DC. And he says, I feel comfortable with being a black, being a gay man, but I don't necessarily feel really comfortable being a black man there. I would not go out and accuse them of being racist, but I think there are aspects of African life or black life that they are uncomfortable with. And he says here, pretty much the Essex Temple quote, there are a few places that I can go where I can feel completely whole in the black community as well as the gay white communities, as well as at work. Um, and then we wanted to know about the penalty and privilege. This is um, Patricia Hill Collins, which you know, says people aren't marginalized all the time and that our penalties and privileges sort of ebb and flow. And so we were also interested in having, you know, so we got all the stories that you might expect about the challenges, the castle, stop the black men, all of that. But also to hear what men would um, say about the sort of benefits of being black gay men. And these are just sort of two. This is Kareem who says, I would say I don't operate within the same boundaries that some of my heterosexual friends are operating because I accept both my feminine and my masculine side. And so there's no conflict. And so for him, he's, he's talking about an expansion of self. Um, I like the freedom to, to be able to just be. Um, and then Brandon, who is younger, 21, he says, I just feel like it's made me a better person. It's forced me to really look at what is life and what it is to be a human, what it is to be a man. And I really feel like it's made me look on, at life as something other than on a surface level. So again, it's sort of deepening um, so that it's not just penalty all the time. Um, there are privileges and sort of as Audre Lorde would talk about, joys at the margin. Um, so implications for future research with this, um, I think that this shows how complex identity is. And so that even though there are these central tenets and intersectionality but you can't rank, well, there's, even in this little tiny sample, you see the diversity of how people are sort of constructing their, uh, as Katie Doe would say, their identity packages. N nor are identities fixed, right? They change. Identities shift by context. You go in a room where you're the only person of you, you know, like who looks like you. You have a different sense of your identity than when you when you sh when you're in um, when you're in the majority context, as an example. Um, an implication for this is how do we reframe um, experiences of, of populations like black gay men 
through the prism of strength and facets and freedom and expansion, and not just a sort of narrow, I mean, particularly in the HIV world, so pathology and this. Um, and what we need more of, I believe, is a greater understanding of the social structural context of black gay men's lives, and which is a project that I'm working on now, revising the grant proposal to really understand things like what is what are black gay men's experiences with racial discrimination. This is sort of the untold stories because we just focus on the sexual risk and HIV. So there's much we don't know about their experience. So I wanted to talk quickly um, in the last few slides about some of the challenges of doing intersectionality research. Unless you come out of a fabulous discipline like women's studies, um, which is where I, I say this all the time, I learned to think critically and analytically in women's studies um, as an undergrad um, and also did my, my um, graduate work. I did a master's in public policy with conservation and women's studies. Um, and before I did my doctorate. Women's studies people get intersectionality, they're introduced to it, but, but opportunities to learn about it outside of um, women's studies are, um, is rare. It's, it's changing, it's changing. Um, there is a risk, um, this concerns me a lot, of what May calls flattening. Um, and by what I mean about flattening is sort of ignoring the role of power and inequality, right? Because that's the uncomfortable stuff. No, I'm not about that. Let's just talk about this. Let's talk about the intersecting identities. Um, but as um, uh, I and a colleague who are writing a lot about quantitative intersectionality research argue, if you're not attending to power and inequality, you're not doing intersectionality. And the quote um, from this that I um, have here is by uh, Cindy Cho, um, Crenshaw, and Leslie McCall. And what they say here is, what makes an analysis intersectional? Whatever turns it deploys, whatever its iteration, whatever its field or discipline, is an adoption of an intersectional way of thinking about the problem of sameness and difference and its relation to power. So it doesn't matter what methods you're using, it doesn't matter what discipline you're coming from. If you're not talking about power, about power you're not doing um, intersectionality. Um, another challenge, as I alluded to when I first started talking, is this is not a traditional theory that you sort of test and, like, you know, the theories that you're learning in, you know, like if you're taking psychology classes. And so it's really, it's, because of that, it is challenging to then figure out how to apply it. And so, one of the great methodological challenges is how to use this framework, particularly for quantitative work. Um, it is far easier, or I argue that it's much more amenable to qualitative work, which is based on getting the complexity, and you, know, you can see it in the quotes that I showed you. It's far trickier doing it quantitatively, because there are a host of issues. One is how you ask about, how you ask questions and not resort to single axis thinking. So, you know, if you're doing a study on, on you know, intersectional discrimination, are you going to ask all the questions about racial discrimination first? Are you then ask all the questions about homophobia? Or And so there are sort of challenges about how to do that. Um, there are issues about how you conceptualize it. Is it just focused on the identities or sort of discrimination, sort of the social processes? There are a whole bunch of design issues. And then how do you interpret it? Another challenge that I mentioned earlier is there's a void. Um, often data is just presented at, you know, at one intersection or two at the most, um, which obscures opportunities to really look at things intersectionality, intersectionally. Um, changing, but we're not there yet. Um, opportunities, that's where I'm gonna end on opportunities and complexity. Um, Intersectionality is invaluable for prompting us to think critically about the, these matrices um, of social identities and, and inequality. As I said earlier, um, it prompts novel research questions about intersectional invisible. Who's missing when you, you know, focus on prototypical populations? It emphasizes the link, I said this over and over, between individual and structural context. It offers, as Clark and McCall argue, potentially different interpretation of the same facts. It takes you in different directions once you start looking through an intersectional prism. 
And it invites innovative and novel methodological questions. And so one of the things, one of the things that I'm doing that's really interesting to me, um, and other geeks like me, is trying to figure out how to do this, how to apply this in large quantitative studies. So I will end on complication. This is Elena Hankiski, and she is the director of an institute for intersectionality research and policy in Vancouver. They are doing amazing <coughs> stuff about intersectionality in Canada at the, at the Canadian government level in terms of integrating intersectionality into their public policy and their health policy. And she has this quote that I just love to end on because this is what we're talking about when we're talking about intersectionality. She says, without doubt, the intersectionality framework complicates everything. It erases rather than avoids the complexities that are essential to understanding social inequities, which in turn manifest in health, in, in health inequity. It's this embrace of intersectionality that makes it so wonderful to be working. And I invite you to join us in this, this complex walk. I will leave there. Thank you. Intersectionality I was recently at a conference and spoke with folks who are focusing on multiracial identity. And so, one topic that we've been discussing is um, uh, identity and validation. So, and I was curious if, because the component of intersex, intersectionality can result in, well, I feel this way and this is how I see myself, but then yeah. the surrounding people are not validating whatever identity I'm putting forth. And so yeah. I was just curious about kind of the conversations or interviews that you had or focus groups, like if if the ideas of, maybe not the terminology of identity and validation that came up and how that might relate to mental health or, or the other health you know, challenges you're studying. Yeah, um, the way it came up in the trials and tribulation study is 
Well, for me, these all blended, but that's not how the world sees me. That's how, that's how they treat me. And so that sort of duality between how you identify and how the world sees it, so yeah, it, it, come, it comes up all the way. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with the ordering of the questions? Um, I understand how the survey research design encourages you to save the more complicated stuff for the end to avoid like response fatigue. But this, this entire subject is really emotionally complicated. And so how do you... You, you mean in, in qualitative? Or, well, like just in your focus groups when you're having these discussions, it's such an intense and emotionally heightened mm -hmm. subject. And, yeah. and so how do you avoid having respondents just kind of check out because it's so intense? Well, I'll let you know a secret. In my experience, um, men are hungry. And what they say at the end of the at the end of the groups, every group, you all have a name for these groups, you don't have opportunities to talk like this. Every single group. I wouldn't go so far as saying that the group, because it is research, mm -hmm. is um, cathartic or therapeutic. But, you know, I mean, we stage it. We, we don't ask, you know, our first question, question's not going to be, you know, when was the last time you were hunting by the police? We don't start there. Um, <laughs> but it's making sure that there's a flow. And it's tricky. Um, but what it really, um, the most important part of that is having a skilled facilitator. Mm -hmm. Oh, who knows? And so, and I never do the focus groups because you know there's research showing that conversations change when a woman is in the room, and I think it's very important for men to talk to men and feel free to say all the things they want to say. Um, and so, um, I've been lucky in manhood to have a really experienced facilitator who can flow and who can bring it back when it goes off track, because it will go off track. So. Um, so the people in the focus group will perceive that the facilitator is not so far removed from like ident the same identity. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a black man. He has a lot of same experience. You know, he's, he's the same sort of language, same rapport, the same sort of trust building. And it's it, in our experience, it is very easy. Which is not to say that you know there's not some checking out. I mean, there are all sorts of dynamics that happen in these groups. Um, <coughs> these two guys are going at it. You know, they're just you know this sort of contentious stuff. But a good facilitator can manage that. Thank you. Um, I was just interested in how uh, black trans men factor into your research. Uh, not much. I mean, in that study, so the <coughs> HIV prevention has been focused on um, men who are having sex with men, and mostly on um, bisexual and gay men. There, there has not been. My research hasn't focused as much on men. Um, when have you started this research? What kind of really interested you in this aspect of your research? Which part? The black gay bisexual or the yeah, HIV prevention? Yeah, that. Which one? The HIV prevention. <laughs> oh, oh it, it was um, just as I said, noticing that black um, heterosexual men were absent from that dialogue. So I did my dissertation. I was interested in relationship power and gender with um, Latinas and black women. And so I knew it a lot, and the literature has a lot about what women have to say about it, but I had the sense of, wait a minute, this is like talking exclusively to women about ending sexual violence. Something is missing here. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that's how I went there. It's not where, when I was doing my doctorate, if somebody had said that my research would have focused exclusively on men, I would be surprised. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering about the practical application of your research because it seems like what you learn from the focus groups from the men that you interview, and what you learn from that doesn't necessarily correlate with the um, prevention methods that the CDC put out. And so I'm just wondering if there's a way to divide that disconnect. You bet it doesn't correlate. Um, in, um, <laughs> in August of 2016, the Office of AIDS at the National Institutes of Health, they released their priorities and what they were interested in using AIDS-related funds for. There were things like search for a cure. There was stuff like pre-exposure of uh, prophylaxis, things like that. Uh, so more biomedical approaches to HIV prevention. And at the very bottom of low-priority issues was they said they were not interested in social and behavioral behavioral approaches to HIV, of which HIV was just one in a list of things that they're interested in. And so there is a way that my research is totally out of step with where the NIH is going, at least as stated in the NIH Office of AIDS Priorities. 
and something I'm pretty, I'm pretty cognizant of. And then we talk a lot about at the Center for AIDS Prevention, the, um, the Center for AIDS um, Research. Um, you know, what, what do we do now? If we can't get funded for this type of research that we think is so important. Um, I also think that from a, I think that this work has policy implications in the sense that we typically use a sort of solo, single axis focus on diseases, right? So it's HIV, <coughs> and there's money for that, and there's diabetes money, and there's cancer. Well, this is cross-cutting. And so through my lens, I'm saying, hey, look, we deal with this unemployment stuff, this criminal record, and all this neighborhood um, distress and violence, we have opportunities to intervene on a whole bunch of substance use cross cutting, but that's not how we approach health in this country. So my question is, um, so my answer is, it doesn't. It doesn't. And so, yeah, but we, you know, we keep trying. In turn, you know, and, and research is important in this aggregate. It's not one study. It's several studies saying the same thing over time, over time. It may not be in my lifetime, but we hope that, you know, we're talking about the need for structural approaches, and there are quite a few of us who are, you know, who are talking about this, and we will make it then, but, you know, there's this little thing called political will, and, and all those complications. So, yeah, it is frustrating, but we keep going. Yeah. How does your work um, in D.C. intersect with um, activist communities within the D.C. That's, That's a good question. Um, and it hints at a project that I'm about to start working on. Because, so there's all the intersectionality work in sort of academic circles, but there's all this stuff on the ground that's already happening, long been happening, right? It's been happening forever. And so I was about to start a new project, I can't say too much about it, with a foundation that is, is engaged in exactly that question, answering that question. What are communities doing, and how can we use that information to shape policy? My work, not so much. I mean, we have all we have a community advisory board for all of our studies with members of the community who are doing work, and so they comment on that. But that's not the same thing as sort of taking it back to community. And this is a this is a place where research, particularly academic research, is not so good. I was talking about this to students in your class because. What you need to get tenure and promotion are things like disseminating your work to the academic community in peer-reviewed um, peer publications. People who are doing work on the front lines, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a there can be a disconnect there. Um, and so it's a good question. So not as much as I would like, other than working with a community advisory group that we, you know, we share measures we give them, we get feedback, we tell them about what we're going to do next. We ask them for feedback on our on our interpretations to make sure that we're you know, not going off the cliff. Okay. Um, one is about intersectionality of quantitative work mm -hmm. and sort of the various iterations that it has taken over the years. Um, some folks would say, oh, I enter interaction terms into my models to yeah. try and capture uh, intersectionality uh, in that way. Intersectionality rejects the notion of adequate identity. Exactly. So it's not only, it's worse than a poor measure, it's not <laughs> has its challenges around pathologizing culture um, as we link those variables to particular uh, negative health outcomes when we don't actually hypothesize that it is the identity that is causing some uh, poor health outcome. So what do you see as uh, sort of the future of our, our ways of better integrating and working with I think it's about trying to bend in the direction of the social processes. Because really, if we look at inequities, it's not the identities in and of themselves. It's the discrimination and prejudice based 
on how the person, the perceiver, is it? So I think we need to go there, and I think we need to try to focus more on the structural, which is really difficult. I was I was trained as a psychologist where the individual is the unit of analysis, and so trying to figure out how, if I'm talking about preventing HIV, I'm talking about something at the neighborhood level and how that affects HIV and how not diabetes of people. I don't know. But I think this is where we need to start having these conversations and what does it look like to assess things at a structural level and look at the intersection of the structure on the individual. And I don't know how to do that, but that's where I think we need to go. I think I think we're way off track if we're talking of wasting time developing managing culture. So I think that was that was quite a business in some ways. So I strong. You said you had a second question? My second question is about um, the processes of oppression that exist within the disciplines that we operate in and how intersectionality sort of challenges our disciplines. Say so, more. Um, so for example, when I think about health disparities research or the, even the notion of health disparities, you know, we really pat ourselves on the back for um, being interested in thinking about different rates of illness and disease in different um, populations. Um, and so what that leads to is, uh, in terms of discipline and in terms of funding, what that leads to is all studies should include white participants. Right? Because we need to be able to compare white, uh, white communities with black in order to know whether or not the disparity exists, and if so, um, how to prioritize these disparities. Um, so in this way, we are still centering white communities, we're still centering men by insisting on inclusion for the purposes of health disparities research, these reference groups, right, that are typically white. And so I'm wondering how you uh, think or if you see intersectionality as sort of challenging some of the um, notions that we are using in our discipline in public health framework. I hope so, which is why I'm also uh, getting um, more uncomfortable with the term health disparities. Um, and really we're hearing more, you'll see it, the, the quote at the end, um, in history in Canada, they talk a lot about inequities. Because a disparity means I got something, you, you have more, that's all. It, it doesn't get to the issue of inequality that underlies that in the first place. And so that's the problem, right? That, it, oh, it's just difference. Well, no, it's not just difference. It's sort of the historical legacy of inequality that that explains um, why, we, why we see the inequities. And so that's my worry, just this, um, it gets back to this notion of flattening. So we're just looking at different groups, and all, all groups are, you know, if you have uh, white people and black people, then it's diversity. Well, no, it's not. And so I think we need to have, you know, uncomfortable and more complex discussions. But I share your, I share your, is that a concern? It's certainly one of mine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Innovation. And so, and I was, I've sat on study sections, this is 
like longer than these four years, and then you review all these grants. And I started seeing all these intersectionality, or you know, the just intersectionality in the title, but no citation to the work. And so there is great interest in intersectionality, even because it's you know sexy and hot, and, right? <laughs> and, or it's perceived to be, but not real. And so I, I do worry about flooding. And so in terms of theoretically innovative, you submit a grant and it has something intersectionality related, then that's um, I don't want to say it's going to get funded, but it is viewed. Um, in or in at least the circles I've traveled today. Um, as for the money, I think that because these intersections have been invisible, we don't know that they're not interested. I think the issue is trying to find out how to show, look, when we have this level of, ine of inequity, it affects you. You think it has nothing to do with you because they live over there and you don't deal with those people, you don't see those people. Well, no, it affects you. Your health insurance premiums, it's because, yeah. And so I think we haven't done a good a job of, and, of, of talking about that. And then also, the, what I see as promising is intersectionality means we're all included, and we all have intersections. And so what are some of the intersections that where we can have sort of common ground that we can talk about? Um, and so I, 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 I reject the notion that, you know, oh, it doesn't benefit them. I just think that we haven't started these sort of complex dialogues about this yet. And that's, you know, it's that intersectionality and visibility and so we're wasting a lot of money on programs that are, um, you know, that most people could have told you before you spent, you know, $3 million, there's no way that's going to work. Um, there's just no way that's going to work. Um, and so we're just not there yet. But I, you know, I, I try to keep optimistic, otherwise I'm, you know, I can't <laughs> I try to keep optimistic. I say often, though, in my work, I always say, there's a reason why people do research with only college students. There is a reason for that. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. One more question, maybe? Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Let's see our